listening to a lecture in History 11 called The Theory of Revolution. I'm going to talk through uh, basic theories about revolutions, and so when you read your um, readings for the course, you'll be able to understand some basic premises of revolutions, and so this will help you to understand the very nature of the American Revolution and uh, also Civil War in 1861-1865 that will kind of undergird and help you to sort of see it in its broader global context. Now, the definition of revolution comes from the Latin word revolutio, which simply means to turn around. So the theory here is, is that you are completely flipping something on its end or completely reversing what is already the status quo. And it is, by any stretch of the ima imagination, a fundamental change in political power or organizational structures that take place when populations rise up and revolt against their authorities. And they entail not only mass mobilization of entire regimes, but also more or less rapid or fundamental social or cultural change during or soon after the struggle for state power. So by and large, revolutions can be things that change governments, but they can also be things that change culture as well. So, for example, we have the sexual revolution, the industrial revolution, the revolution in music. We have many of these sort of things that happen. And so that's what, generally speaking, we're talking about when we're talking about revolutions. Not necessarily the change in governments, but by and large the changing of social structures or cultural structures in and of themselves. Now, there are different kinds of revolutions. There is the coup, which basically is a top-down seizure of power. There are civil wars, where wars between organized groups within the same particular country. You can have revolts or rebellions, which is just a simple rise against authority that gives way to greater revolutions that tr can then transform political and social structures. And we will talk a, a little bit about those, particularly when we get to the slave rebellions. Now, throughout human history, you should be aware that there have been revolutions that have taken place in the past. Some of the more important ones or ones that seem to have caught the eye of most historians are the Athenian Revolt, the Ionian Revolt, the American, the French, the Russian, Islamic revolutions, the Industrial Revolution that begins sometime around 1715 through 1760 to 1840. Right? And needless to say that most of these revolutions vary according to methods, lengths, and motivations, and some of them do result in major changes in society. But I'd like to add a caveat here in that most revolutions, particularly those aimed against governments, usually uh, fail. Um, the one unique thing about the American Revolution is that it was an absolute success where most revolutions are in fact failures. Now, some of the revolutions that have affected American society that you should, of course, be aware of is our own American Revolution, the French Revolution, where we begin to see these ideas that liberty, fraternity, and equality can be spread out amongst large masses of people, and that masses of people can demand their uh, fair share in the governance of their own populations or their own countries. The Haitian Revolution that pushed forward a complete uh, shudder or feeling of anxiety amongst the uh, South um, um, as that revolution occurred and many years after leading into the Civil War. The Rev Russian Revolution in 1917, the Cuban Revolution and from 1956 to that lasted literally all the way to into the 1970s, the Iranian Revolution from 78 to 79, the Nicaraguan Revolution in 1979, all of these revolutions in some form or fashion have affected the United States. Either we intervened um, to help one side or the other, or in particular, when it came to the Bolshevik Revolution, we ended up fighting a protracted Cold War with the Soviet Union after the Bolsheviks were victorious in their revolutions. Now, why do revolutions occur? For the most part, um, they occur after prolonged periods of economic and social development. Either the economies stagnate 
or the there is some overall change in fundamental ideas by the way that people think their consciousness changes over time and then you have uh, sharp periods of reversal where you might have had a, a certain way or identity of the way the society functioned and then all of a sudden there are new ways or people agitate for changes within that society or just a complete anxiety and frustration breaks through or breaks hold and grips the population and removes them from their own particular realities. Some people have asked, why don't people who are poor or extremely poor uh, revolt? And the answer to that is pretty simple, is that because people's physical and mental energies are typically sapped. And so when they have a choice between choosing chains or life, most people will choose life. And this is usually the, the overall fundamental sentiment that we have for, for example, American slavery, where there were quite a number of slave rebellions, but in many ways there wasn't the kind of mass uprising that we saw, let's say, in Haiti, as there um, um, or at least the, 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 the successful rebellion in Haiti never really took hold in the United States. And there are very reasons for that. Um, and as you do your reading in slavery in the United States, you'll start to understand why that happens. But nevertheless, what usually typically happens is that people will choose life over death. And so then that's the, the single thing that ties slaves, uh, the slave systems together is simply terror. Now, the American Revolution, we can, the, the time period for this, your book will cover this, but it's from 1765 to basically 1783. The war, the hostilities, the actual fighting is from 1775 to 1783. Um, just some basic facts about the war that the people in the colonies who were fighting were called American patriots, right? We fought this war against Great Britain and France and other countries were our allies. This map shows the states that fought in the revolution or the future states. The, these are colonies at this particular time period. Um, and so you should have some idea where these colonies are and the listing of colonies. And of course, today, all of these are uh, part of the United States. The primary argument for the revolution was simple, taxation without representation. Parliament had enacted a series of tax laws, which your book will cover, and so the colonials made the argument, which I think was a very good one, was that you cannot uh, tax us as long as we're not represented in Parliament. And your book will cover this basic premise that people within Parliament talked about, which was virtual representation, and why they believe that the colonials did not need to be represented in Parliament. But this is basically the crux of the argument here. And they had asserted, going back to the Bill of Rights of 1689, that the king must receive consent um, of the people, and hence taxation without representation. These are the Sons of Liberty who would organize themselves to fight this taxation without representation. Now, there were quite a number of rebellions in the United States. Uh, Shays Rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, Freeze Rebellion, the Anti-Rep Wars in the 1840s, the Taos Revolt in 1847, the Battle of Liberty Place in 1874, the Election Riots, uh, Wilmington Insurrection, Green Corn Rebellion, Coal Wars, Battle of Athens, San Juan Nationalist Revolt in the 1950s, the Black Panther movements from the 1960s to the present, the Red Power movements, 1960s to the present, the Attica Prison Riot, even the occupation of Mahler National Wildlife Re uh, Refuge in 2016 would be considered in some ways a rebellion or a revolt. So if you can look at this, you can see that in the United States there have been a significant number of rebellions, some larger, some smaller, um, and they all have different and varying motivations, and you can look some of these things up and, and figure them out for yourself.
One of the more important of the slave rebellions were, uh, or the rebellions were, the slave rebellions. And there were quite a number of them. German Coast Uprising, slave revolts in the Cherokee Nation, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859, and of course the American Civil War that put an end to slavery from 1861 to 1865. The three major rebellions and the most important of these was Gabriel Prosser's in 1800, Denmark Vesey Rebellion in 1822, and Nat Turner's Rebellion in 1831. What all of these three rebellions, and in some ways the other rebellions had in common, was religion was used as a pretext. Most of the rebels were highly religious, either in their own African religions or in the religions um, that were given to them, the Protestant religions here in the United States. They all shared a deep hatred of slavery. There was always a deep fear among whites within these areas and massive repression of slaves within these areas um, or oppression of free people. All of their rebellions were betrayed by their uh, fellow slaves and of course large militias were sent down to put down these rebellions. And then what really is important for us is in terms of these rebellions is that harsher measures were applied um, after each of these rebellions and, and these measures we call black codes. Now these black codes in some way, right, beginning with Gabriel Prosser's led probably to Denmark Vesey's to led to led to Nat Turner's rebellion in some fundamental way. Gabriel Prosser and the first of the major uh, slave revolts in the American South was 24 years old when the re rebellion broke out and he was deeply religious and what we know, which is not a lot about him or the rebellion is that um, when his men were uh, moving uh, to attack, their rebellion was cut short from a thunderstorm and they were betrayed. Um, and Prosser and his followers were hung. And uh, the background to this is quite short and simple, um, that Virginia slaves at the time period enjoyed a considerable amount of freedom and many of their masters would hire them out to other plantations, right, to make more money. So some of these slaves enjoyed a considerable amount of freedom, and what that did is it allowed Gabriel Prosser and other blacks to socialize. So they would talk about the ideals of freedom, or they would meet people, black, other black people that were they themselves were free. Um, they would make friends with poor whites who distrusted and disliked slave owners as well. And so they developed uh, these alliances that gave them sort of the courage and the impetus to strike out. What we know about Prosser is that he was about six feet two uh, and described as a fellow of courage and intellect above his rank in life. Um, he um, stated I, um, that when asked why the rebellion, and he said this, we had as much right to fight for our liberty as any men. So they were probably greatly influenced by the uh, American Revolution in and of itself. Prosser and his fellows were sentenced to hang on October 7th, and an eyewitness who was there said that the accused exhibited a spirit uh, which, if becomes general, must deluge the southern country in blood. So in other words, if there were more people like a Gabriel Prosser, then the South would be in trouble because more rebellions would ensue. Denmark Vesey was born a slave, uh, was a slave to George Wilson, and um, that rebellion, um, excuse me, that rebellion was uh, in, um, put down because the slave George Wilson informed uh, the master of the potential plot. Um, so typically in these slave rebellions, what you would find is, is that um, these slaves would meet in secret. Um, they would gain the confidence of individuals in their little circle. And then someone within that group would then go out and inform of the plot. And why they would do this is that generally speaking, if you discovered a plot and you were a slave and you were informed on the plot, and it led to the arrest or conviction of people who were 
involved in the plot, then you probably might get your freedom or some general reward. And that generally was um, uh, basically the motivation for uh, sort of, you know, informing people of the potential plot. This one was the most extensive re resurrection to, to date, even though there were quite a number of them. The VC plot was perhaps at the time period the largest to date. Now, VC basically was transported from St. Thomas in 1771 and was owned by Captain VC. Um, and by 1799, he was married, had kids, and to his great luck that he played the lottery, won $600 and was able to buy his freedom. Uh, VC then joined the African Methodist Episcopal Church within Charleston and became a leader of that and railed against um, the usurpation by whites of that church. And we think that um, VC, because whites were consistently trying to disrupt church services, um, probably took it upon himself to do something about that. So we know that he met church members to plot the rebellion and that he was greatly influenced by an East African priest named Gula Jack and combining this sort of VC's own Protestant theology along with Gula Jack's African mysticism, the revolt was set for July 4th and of course the pl plot was leaked and betrayed. VC was hung on July 2nd. The aftermath of the VC plot was the African Methodist Church was burned down, black codes were instituted within Charleston, limiting uh, the number of uh, activities or the whereabouts or the movements of blacks, and VC then became a martyr. Nat Turner's rebellion um, began. Um, in 1831, and we see that Nat Turner was born in 1800 in Southampton County, Virginia. And most people who knew Nat Turner claimed that he had just extraordinary or uncanny mental abilities and that he was a deeply religious person. And there were even some suggestions that he was a prophet. Now, Turner consistently claimed that he had visions and he, at one particular point, escaped, but he returned. And we're not quite sure why he returned, but we know that he did that. And some of the things that he suggested uh, um, that he saw his visions were that he saw things like hieroglyphic characters, blood dripping from trees, um, uh, that, you know, he sort of cobbled together these this vision of a uh, prophetic vision of why um, he would stage a plot to free his fellow um, blacks from slavery. So what ends up in your, I think your book covers this pretty well, um, is that um, Turner and about 40 slaves moved from house to house, killing whites, and a militia had to be sent in to put down the rebellion. Now, we know quite a bit about Nat Turner's rebellion simply because of the fact that there was a book written uh, about the rebellion called the Confessions of Nat Turner. A um, reporter interviewed Nat Turner and subsequently wrote a book and it gives a detailed account about why Nat Turner um, actually conducted this rebellion. Um, 55 blacks were executed, many banished, some were acquitted, and as a reprisal for this rebellion, whites in the area murdered about 200 innocent black people. Um, and even uh, after this rebellion, whites debated on whether or not they should abolish slavery. They did not. Um, and of course, that then would lead them on to eventual destruction within uh, the Civil War from 1861 to 1865. Okay, so the conclusion here is that revolutions we know are as old as civilization. Revolutions take on many forms and ideologies. The United States has undergone numerous revolutions, some known, some lesser known. And uh, revolutions become either notorious or patriotic depending upon who writes the history. For example, Nat Turner's Rebellion and who are the victors, right? The American South or the 
uh, Northern Army. Okay, so that about encapsulates this. All of this information is in some detail in your readings. And um, that's it.